Okay, folks, well, uh, welcome to this session on Call for Code. Uh, my name is Daniel Crook, and with me today is Charles Johnson. Uh, we both work at IBM, um, and we're also members of the Call for Code community, which we'll talk about today, it has a couple of different components, uh, and how it relates to the Linux Foundation. Um, so our goal here is to show how you can leverage that community uh, to learn about some of the tech for good projects that we have at the Linux Foundation, how you can build skills, um, setting them up, running them yourselves, and how you can contribute back to them as well. Uh, how many of you attended the AGRAC reg session from these two earlier today? No? Okay, well, obviously you guys. Um, and uh, how about anybody here already familiar with Call for Code? Okay, we've got one over here. So I won't spend too, too much time on that. Um, great, so um, Call for Code launched about five years ago, um, and it was launched by four organizations together, uh, one of which was IBM as a founding partner, together with the Linux Foundation, uh, the United Nations Human Rights Office, and David Clark Cause. Uh, he's a fellow that um, engages uh, eminent politicians, eminent uh, world leaders, um, celebrities, uh, other types of folks to really inspire people to take on humanitarian challenges. Uh, he's had some other um, programs, for example, for veterans, uh, for, for um, clean water, uh, things like that. So uh, it was launched, and, and from the IBM point of view, uh, we really wanted to continue to build upon our legacy of doing great, amazing things, putting a man on the moon, um, having machine play Jeopardy and win. Uh, so it is really an extension of, of what IBM kind of represents in terms of uh, having that tech for good point of view. So it goes back into our DNA. Um, so what really does set it apart, though, is that we don't just run a competition, a glo global competition every year. Uh, what we do is we also want to inspire those ideas and not just recognize them, but also uh, help them live on as sustainable open source projects. And that's really where the Linux Foundation um, comes in very important here. Uh, we also, as the IBM side of that, is support the teams with mentorship, uh, open source best practices, and uh, we support the projects, deploy them um, through our set of IBM volunteers called the Service Corps. Uh, so in those, in those five years since we've launched, uh, we've had uh, half a million developers, data scientists, project managers, folks of all kinds take part in the competitions, um, as well as students from around the world um, and from every corner of the globe, which has been really amazing to see in our communities, uh, people communicating, collaborating, working together. And in fact, one of the teams that, that won one of the competitions, they had a member from Taiwan, one from Mongolia, one from India, and one from Brazil. So really a global, uh, global community. And we've taken on, um, a, in that global challenge each year, there's a focus on one particular issue, and um, it's gone from disaster resiliency um, to responding to individual needs, of health and well-being of folks taking on natural disasters, uh, through to more of the cause behind that disaster resiliency, which has been climate change. And in particular, in 2000, uh, we had various activities and events around upcoming challenges like the social and business impact of the pandemic and uh, racial justice, right, the struggle against racial injustice uh, through a, a program called Call for Code for Racial Justice. Um, and so we've had uh, various projects that not only took part and emerged from competitions, but also things that grew organically from initiatives inside of IBM, uh, started by folks like Gorov, who we actually have an internal competition for IBMers and Red Hat folks, um, created a solution as well. So um, Tech for Good coming to take on a uh, broad uh, series of issues resulting in a set of uh, open source projects within the Linux Foundation. So uh, as I mentioned, what sets it apart, it's not just that competition, it's not just what recognizing a project, giving a prize. What we do is uh, together with partners like Samsung um, and the United Nations uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Organization and plenty of other folks in the ecosystem, is we help those teams that emerge from the challenges uh, to get through an incubation uh, phase, we call it a deployment framework, uh, basically that gets them over the course of about a year from that raw innovation through to improving their functional, non-functional requirements, security, usability, um, having them partner with go-to-market or 
other experts that can test and validate what they created uh, was something really uh, important for that issue, that they were going after the right issue. And finally, to get them to a stage where they're ready to graduate, as it were. So uh, all of this work is through uh, an incubation framework. And at one point, they, whether they're a startup, a part of an enterprise, maybe a nonprofit, um, they are ready to um, live on as a sustainable project um, that is uh, that that doesn't require um, the incubation phase anymore, and uh, they they are released as open source projects at the Linux Foundation. Uh, so let's take a look at those projects, and I'll come back to the uh, the 2022 competition in in just a bit. Um, but within um, Call for Code at the Linux Foundation, so. Call for Code is the, the initiative itself. Um, this, uh, this is an entity, a legal entity at the Linux Foundation, which holds all of the projects, governs them neutrally, uh, maintains their trademarks, um, and adheres to several of the other best practices for open source projects. So ensuring there's a code of conduct, ensuring that there's a contributor agreement, um, and that the, the GitHub um, uh, projects are, are properly structured in a way that encourages contribution and use as well. Uh, so we do have 14 projects in there. Uh, if you go to the linuxfoundation.org uh, projects page, it's kind of linked from the masthead anytime you're at, at um, that page. Uh, you can find them, it's a highlighted um, group of projects. So it's kind of like an umbrella in and of itself. And that has uh, each of the 14 projects, including uh, ones that have come through the global challenge as well as the, the other programs like Call for Code for Racial Justice. Um, and speaking of Call for Code for Racial Justice, this was not a set of projects that came through the global competition. Um, this was actually using Call for Code as an engine to um, build amazing new technology to take on racial justice using that same framework. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's, it's, there's Call for Code, the competition, um, and then there's the, the uh, open source structure of everything that's at the Linux Foundation. Uh, so we had seven projects come in, uh, came from within IBM and Red Hat, uh, and launched um, in 2021. Uh, the other part of what IBM does for these open source projects is we make sure that um, people are able to kind of understand and consume them um, so they can use them, put them to work wherever uh, they need to apply, maybe in their community. Uh, there's also a bunch of tutorials, videos, um, blog posts that we've produced for them. And um, we ensure that they all have those proper governance documents, right? So making sure that they've got code of conducts, uh, that's clear that if someone creates a pull request or opens an issue, kind of what they can expect in terms of the time um, that, they, that, that it'll take for it to be um, uh, addressed or, or taken on. So always just working within these communities, making sure as they're fledging projects, fledging projects that they're becoming mature and, and really taking advantage of best practices. So um, we'll take you through a couple of these projects, actually all 14. The first seven, um, uh, Charles will, will describe a few of them and some of the ones he's new to the team. He's actually leading one of the projects right now, mentoring the open source community, but also contributing back some new features. So he'll take you through the seven call for code for racial justice open source projects. And then uh, I'll talk about the, the other ones that have come from the global competition and um, go from there. Hi everyone. Um, again, my name is Charles Johnson. Uh, I'm going to speak on a few of the Call for Code for Racial Justice projects. Uh, one that I am uh, actively working on is the Incidency Accuracy Reporting System. And what this provides is a platform for victims or uh, someone who's observing a scenario or interaction with the police department and they find that they need to provide feedback from that incident, whether that be photos, audio, video. Um, uh, many of these projects came about uh, due to the George Floyd tragedy. Um, and people wanted to do something. So many of these projects came up through that chain. Uh, specifically, this is one of those. Um, 
And with this platform, it provides uh, two-way interaction, not only for the observer or the victim, but it gives them a direct channel into the police department as well. So what you're seeing on the screen here is actually the mobile app, which the uh, person submitting an incident would use, uh, someone in the community. And what you see on the laptop behind there would be a dashboard that the police department would use to uh, collect these incidents and integrate them into their uh, existing platform. Okay. Moving on, uh, Legit Info. This uh, project provides a platform uh, for those who want to come and pro provide uh, more information on legislation. Okay. Um, Fair Change. Fair Change is another platform that is in ways similar to what we call incidency accuracy reporting, but it takes a, uh, a, a deviation where it, rather targeting local police department, it takes it to a national level or a, uh, a beyond, okay? And in, in addition, it does also have an app that you can go in and capture photos and videos and so forth, and uh, collect location information also to provide that back. So Take Two. Uh, Take Two is another project where uh, it seeks to analyze information that's out in the world and try to r reduce or eliminate um, racial bias language within that structure and platform. Open Citizen um, takes a similar approach, whereas it empowers the public defenders to address uh, racial disparities in the justice system. Now, Five Fifth Voters is an interesting one where it targets the voting system and tries to uh, make sure that when a election takes place that it is fair. Truth Loop uh, provides a mobile friendly way for users to examine policies, um, regulations, and legislation information, allowing them increasing legal awareness and start a discussion. And I'm going to pause here for Daniel to come up and talk about some of our other projects. Awesome. Thank you, Charles. Um, so I think one of the great things about those projects that Charles mentioned, and it applies to these other projects as well, is that they're all based on um, various technologies that folk, different developers can get involved in. As you notice, some of them were data set oriented for data scientists. Uh, some of them are mobile applications. I think they're based on React Native, um, some of those projects. Um, and then there's others that are like browser extensions enabled through uh, the Chrome browser. Uh, so lots of different ways in those projects to leverage open source technology themselves uh, to create those innovations. So uh, really cool projects. Now, going to the ones that came from the climate change and uh, disaster resiliency track, um, one of the first, actually our very first global challenge winner was, um, came from a team called Project Owl. And you'll see the way the Linux Foundation works is there's often a startup or a company uh, that creates the project, the innovation. And then when it's released as um, an open source be, uh, project at the Linux Foundation, they take over the trademarks and the logos and things like that. Uh, so some of the projects actually have gone in as what they were named. They're completely donated, uh, just like the Call for Code for Racial Justice project. Uh, but some of these have those, the dual naming. Uh, there's kind of a sponsor or a lead project behind them. And in this case, that's Project Owl. They won the global challenge in 2018. Uh, and they released their code through Linux Foundation, uh, the open source part of it, as the Cluster Duck protocol. 
Um, so in this case, what they did was they built an IoT-based system, and actually Charles is, is one of the folks that was, that was on this team taking part in the competition. Uh, we recruited him into IBM to, to uh, continue to help with Call for Code, but also support the open source development of this with the Project Owl startup that lives outside of IBM. Um, but here is it's, it's a network that was uh, built to be uh, quickly and cheaply deployable after a disaster. Uh, a lot of the solutions, for example, that took on connectivity challenges in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, uh, they were expensive or they took months to deploy. And in many cases, while it was easy to get power back on through a generator or solar, uh, network connectivity, even enough to just send basic messages, sometimes wasn't restored for nine months. Um, so this is really looking for um, making cheap and ubiquitous mesh networks that can be put in challenging locations, and in fact, even something that can uh, be deployed into space, which is really cool if you want to check out that project. Uh, the following year's challenge winner um, was a team named Prometeo uh, from Spain, and uh, they released their open source project together with Samsung. Um, it's called uh, the Pura platform, and again, it's an IoT solution. It's focused on wildland firefighters, um, so folks that don't have the city apparatus of a regular firefighter inside of a building. Uh, there's a lot of equipment for that, but when you're battling wildfires, or uh, more likely, when you're preemptively doing burns, um, you're getting exposed to a lot of toxins and chemicals, and uh, it's kind of hard to measure that. Um, a lot of the ways that this was done, and particularly in Spain, was uh, there was a nurse um, or an EMT that followed around firefighters to kind of record how they were feeling in kind of an analog way. Um, so it's one of those ways that you can use digital technology, find the averages over time, and plot it on a dashboard. Um, Isaac Simo uh, came from a nonprofit named Build Change, and what they do is they focus on uh, ensuring building quality in the um, emerging nations. Uh, so ensuring that when, for example, a wall is structured like this, the bricks are in the right pattern, uh, and that the spacing of windows over doors uh, ensures a continuous column. Uh, so really cool uh, data science in there to actually detect the centroids and locations of bricks, giving a quick way for someone to assess or validate that the work done by somebody else is, is right up to quality specs. Um, another project came into the Call for Code community, but through a different path, um, is from a team named Grio. Uh, and this is, again, an IoT device, but it's focused on earthquake early warnings. Um, a lot of countries around the world do not have a unified national system. Um, it's only like the West Coast, the US, Korea, South Korea, and Japan, and those are billion dollar systems. Um, and what this aims to be is uh, use uh, cheap sub $100 components, high quality components, but um, fairly low cost, uh, to aggregate those together to give people uh, a minute or two extra warning that an earthquake is, is on its way so they can get to someplace safe. Um, liquid prep is a solution built for um, measuring um, the current soil humidity and understanding that in places with scarce access to water, uh, they make that farmers can make better decisions about when to water based on predicted and upcoming weather. Um, so IoT solution with an Android component uh, using open data sets. Um, DroneAid is um, a project that was also inspired by um, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And what this was inspired by was a lot of folks were writing help messages when they didn't have the connectivity uh, on painting on asphalt, writing on bed sheets. But by using a United Nations um, uh, OCHA standard iconography, together with visual recognition and machine learning, uh, it's a system for actually detecting those, whether you're using a drone, uh, whether it's civil aviation flying over, or even satellite, um, so that these things can be detected on the ground uh, during search and rescue. So a uh, really simple, powerful way to use open source, train a model, and um, deploy it um, in a way that can be used in lots of different ways without, um, uh, without needing to be localized, really. And finally, um, kind of the, I think the most fun project that uh, was in the Call for Code inventory is something called Rendomatic. Uh, this was inspired by folks um, in, um, in the United Kingdom who were really looking at how do you continue to support uh, singing in choirs, kids singing in choirs, people trying to get together remotely to collaborate on songs. Uh, there was a lot of that in the early pandemic, but if you notice, it either had to be recorded separately and, co and, and mixed together. If it was live, there was echo from Zoom and WebEx and things like that. Uh, so this is actually a software solution that supports up to 300 synchronized bagpipers 
um, singing the same song. It links all the sound waves together. It reduces that delay. There's always going to be an incremental delay when you're matching up these videos, these separate segments. Um, it's really a fascinating demo, but um, really cool technology that, um, that kind of took on that, that challenge of how do, you, how do you do a concert together. And as I mentioned earlier, for, for all these projects, there's plenty of um, uh, resources for getting to take part in those. And we, we do have, of course, uh, plenty of other projects that are underway right now. Um, Agrily, as if you were at the Ag session earlier, is another solution that won Call for Code in 2020. We're still working through releasing their project as Open Tempest with the Linux Foundation. You'll, you'll probably hear about that one um, th this summer. And Softwater was last year's winner, uh, really for measuring the quality of groundwater focused on a use case based in India, uh, where some of the team developers' family were affected actually by changes in chemicals being introduced in the water. So uh, leveraging SMS technology to alert people there might be a problem and uh, providing mitigation strategies for it. So these are hopefully some great projects you'll be seeing in the open source community pretty soon. Uh, and let me hand it over to uh, Charles again to talk a bit about some of the work that's being done from a framework level to deploy these projects in a more consistent way. Okay. So um, my background, um, within IBM here recently has been uh, work within OpenShift Kubernetes platforms. And uh, coming on to the Call for Code community, uh, one of the observations that I had was the most or many of the projects do run on the cloud. The manner in which you deploy them varies you have a, a set of instructions that you go through to deploy them. Well, uh, coming from a, a different enterprise application, um, the deployment there was standardized. And within Red Hat OpenShift, uh, we have the Red Hat OpenShift market where you can go choose operators and install applications at a point and click. So our push that we're gonna have for this year will be to implement operators into the platform uh, to ease the deployment of these projects that you've seen, some of them, that do deploy onto the cloud. It's gonna be a stair-step process, of course, but the, the, the time involved to deploy these projects will significantly reduce um, through that uh, web interface. It'll take out a lot of the command line uh, necessity from this. Um, in addition to that, um, we want to enable those who may not know uh, much on the top rate of optics to educate. So we'll also provide this as an opportunity to provide education on operators throughout the year as we level through this process. So stay tuned for that. Um, there will be more coming um, on the topic, but expect that uh, some of our projects will be announced soon with operators. All right, so a second topic that I wanted to talk about, and uh, one of these projects I mentioned earlier, but let's, let's talk about um, uh, a, a dashboard. Um, a lot of our uh, projects, even the ones that, that come in, um, we, several. And they all have varying levels of UIs that are associated with them, whether that be a home page that someone wanted to create, um, a, a dashboard for an admin. So if you have uh, these IoT devices, where are they reporting? How are you looking at that information, right? Everyone's developing their own UIs and things like that. And if they want to go that direction, that's great. Sometimes they don't. They want to just get to the work and not handle the UI aspect of it. Well, within IBM, we do have um, a design system called the Carbon Design System. Um, it's actually available for um, all major um, JavaScript frameworks, not just React. This, this dashboard is built on React, and it's the community is uh, mostly behind React, but there is a community involvement in both Angular and Vue.js. So those options are available too. 
Um, but we're providing a dashboard that showcases components of the carbon design system along with providing our anyone. It's just not just call for code uh, projects that want to submit, but anyone that, that wants to use the carbon design system and wants a starting point. That you will have a uh, ready-made UI uh, available to use. And we're going to do a short demonstration, but I don't want to. Okay, I'll tap to it. Oh, yeah, there's carbon, and then there's a slide there. Okay. So I won't spend too much time on the carbon design system, but if you want to know more information, there is a wealth of information. And one of the best tutorials that I've been through before is on this website. It's, it is, uh, uh, I believe, React-based, um, but it is an awesome tutorial to go from nothing to something, okay? Um, and if you're interested in the components, You'll see that there's a list of, of them here. I don't want to go through them. Uh, a lot of these are taken into this design system, uh, this dashboard that we're presenting. And this is the dashboard. It's available on the Call for Code page. Um, I think it was on the slide. We'll get back yeah, there, there in just yeah, a moment. It's that tab. That's the repo. Yeah. For oh, the, yeah. the repo here? Yeah. And it, it, it provides the code there. Um, we welcome um, feedback. Um, let's make it better. Um, that's, that's what this is all about. Um, and the demo here, if you just want to log in with uh, the credentials, demo, demo, you'll be taken to the dashboard here. And you can see, uh, there we go, that there's quite a bit going on here as far as components that were listed on that page, from charts to tiles to uh, varying designs of fonts that are uh, standardized. And we have a dashboard here where we can then get into a, a few things like searching. Right? Um, let's say we're looking for Harry. Right? And then we can expand this out. Right now we're just showing five. Well, let's show a few more. Let's say 50. Right? And, and these, these are all provided standard through the, the platform, okay? And you could come in here and archive or edit these entries as you see fit. And again, a standard UI throughout. That's, that's what uh, we wanted to achieve here. Um, and this is built on the latest version of the Carbon Design System, which just recently uh, launched back in, I believe it was March, um, maybe April, but... Uh, and there are other pages here that you can visit, the user profile, the new report. Um, in addition to, if I log out and register, there's also a registration page. So some of the key components that you would seek when you're developing an application online, this is ready-made if you want to use it. Though, don't get me wrong, if you, this is your passion and you want to go create your own, Carbon is a great uh, platform to use. It's not the only one, um, but it is one that is, uh, it has a lot of support behind it. Okay, uh, that is everything that I wanted to discuss, and I'll let Daniel come and move it back over <laughs> to right. the presentation. Hold that up there. Okay, great, thank you, Charles. Um, so yeah, there's, as, as Charles uh, noted, um, there's, there's plenty of other, pro in addition to the, the core Call for Code projects, we've got a whole bunch of resources there as well. And what we've noticed in, over the years with Call for Code is, it, you know, originally we thought Call for Code was going to appeal just to developers who are ready to build solutions and use their code skills. But we realized really quickly, and especially with the second year, when the project team included a firefighter, um, a PhD engineer, a uh, nurse on that team, that um, a lot of folks weren't that familiar with open source. They understood kind of the, the idea of it, but they didn't know quite how to do the mechanics of it. Um, so what we've really done in the last, um, in addition to what else you'll find in that call for code GitHub organization, uh, there's, there's uh, new repos in there. 
there's a um, basically a project sample that captures many of the Linux Foundation best practices. So it's a template repo you can clone and reuse for any project, whether you're taking part in Call for Code or not. Uh, it encapsulates some of that. And then there's a, a new one we created, which is actually based on the Carbon one that, um, that Charles mentioned, which is really cool. And I, that's why I reused kind of the bot technique behind it. But it's an automated way for people to kind of make their first contribution, their full, first pull request to a project. Going through that mechanic of writing new code, or forking the repository, uh, writing new code that fixes a bug, submitting it back to the project, and then being told whether it fixed the bug or not. So it's an automated system. Uh, when I was first getting into open source many years ago, that was one of the things that always scared me, is I didn't want to mess with anybody's project, right? I didn't want to do something wrong and get yelled at. Um, so really, that's the intent of this, um, this practice pull requests repo. Um, so give that a try. If you've got a GitHub account, um, go ahead and play around with it and get familiar with that. And, and together with both these resources, there's also a badge you can earn for an introduction to open source course. It's about four to six hours of time. Uh, you'll learn a lot about the best practices, uh, the things we adhere to in the Call for Code community. Uh, you get a nice little badge and certificate at the end of that. Um, and there are other different ways, too, beyond GitHub that folks can contribute to Call for Code projects. Um, we've had folks, particularly with the Call for Code for Racial Justice projects, I think, come from a, a very wide array of backgrounds. So even if you just have a few hours, maybe you have some days, maybe you have some weeks uh, to contribute, um, documentation is always a great place to start. Design, new logos. The Open EW logo came from Hacktoberfest. Um, a couple years ago, somebody just created that uh, amazing, cool little simple waveform. Um, you know, sharing information, providing feedback. Uh, for example, with this new dashboard, if you play around with that, you find a bug or it doesn't work. We, I know we have a dependent bot alert in there, for example. Uh, we can at least get some pull requests to kind of fix that. But people can kind of test and let us know those things. Um, and obviously community events as well. Uh, but yeah, documentation, providing legal advice was one of the big ones as well. Um, you know, helping do some hackathons around the things, uh, reviewing licenses, um, and really helping drive adoption whether you're a user, a contributor, or you want to otherwise build your own skills and take part in the community. So definitely um, encourage you to do that even if you're not technical. Okay, so um, we talked to, we focused at Open Source Summit on purely the open source side of what we do with Call for Code at the Linux Foundation, but in order to generate that innovation that is eventually released as the open source project, uh, we do run the global competition every year. Um, and this year's focus is on sustainability, which includes lots of different kind of sub-themes too. So if you give that a scanner, just go to ibm.com slash call for code. You can learn about this year's challenge, um, kind of how we're, we're, we're providing the tools and the tutorials and the, the mentorship to help you build applications um, that address these issues, which basically acts as an umbrella of over many of the themes we've done in call for code of the year that we found really inspiring and in need of solutions by talking to experts. Um, so carbon emissions, clean energy, supply chain, uh, things like that. Lots of subtopics within, lots of great ways to, um, to, take, uh, to take part in Call for Code. Uh, again, um, this inspires some folks, uh, but we've got $200,000 grand prize for the top Call for Code solution this year. Uh, and then the top five also get a cash prize and support from the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation, beyond what we do with Call for Code, includes mentorship, funding, stipends for... Um, for interns um, that your project needs, dashboards. And in fact, they've got a great um, booth up on the show floor uh, if you want to go talk to the LFX folks, folks to learn about what sort of things. If you bring your own project to the Linux Foundation, even if it's not call for code, um, kind of how you can take part in that. Um, and then, of course, with these, we'll also be supporting the top project uh, through a, uh, a service core deployment with top IBM volunteers. And we did launch um, back in April. And we've had uh, one accelerator event, uh, which kind of had its own, its own mini challenge with its own uh, prize. Uh, but there are other uh, two other upcoming challenges, two week accelerators, and uh, submissions and judging will go through the end of the year. Uh, so a little bit of a longer window than normal. Normally it's only four months uh, in the middle of the year, uh, but we've expanded out to see some 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 greater uh, contributions this year. Now submissions. Um, so to take part in Call for Code, uh, it's really about uh, you know, finding some value in the community, expanding your network, learning new skills, um, start building those solutions. Uh, we've provided um, four Call for Code participants a particular type of IBM Cloud account, which gives you free access to 
things like Kubernetes clusters and, and other free services uh, that you can use to build your solutions for the competition. And, um, and we hope you submit something this year. Okay, and with that, um, were there any questions? audience? Okay, we've got maybe something queued up from the virtual audience. Or she's got a microphone if anybody has questions. Oh. All right, so we got a virtual question from Tim. He said, I would like to submit a project. However, I don't like the privacy policy as too much of my info is shared. Any suggestions? Uh, should I repeat the question or is that, did that go to the audio system? Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so the question was somebody uh, wants to take part in the competition, but the participation agreement is a little bit too, um, asking for too much information. I don't have a direct question to that. Um, I'd answer to that and maybe we can have someone answer that. Um, but uh, it would love, I'd love to, for example, have you join the Slack community, raise that question uh, to anybody tags an IBM mentor, um, and then we can get you direct, we can direct message you or answer you in, in the help desk channel. Um, and also to know what part of participation is Exactly, yeah, Brandy mentioned something good. So if you can call out especially what, what you didn't like in there, that's helpful as well. I think the participation agreement, it's been consistent the last five years. Um, there may be some new things that apply to the Be My App platform, which is the third party platform running it this year. Uh, so we'd also like to know if it's a call for code thing or a Be My App platform thing. Okay. Good. Uh, was there another virtual question or was that one it? Okay. Okay, great. Great, and um, just a couple of closing slides, right? So um, if you were at the keynotes, and I basically um, I think the common theme to every keynote today was security, security, security. Uh, so IBM, we, we've got our, our point of view on that as well. We've been involved with several, several Linux Foundation type of uh, efforts, including OpenSSF. Uh, so you can check out some of those materials. Um, that is definitely, I think that's always important in software engineering, but particularly with, with open source, uh, being transparent uh, understanding where your data is coming from, how it's handled, uh, all goes into uh, software supply chain. And then we've got some folks that are working the booth today um, throughout the week as well. Uh, so stop over there. There's a book signing tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I know Emily, she did a great talk uh, earlier today on micro profile. Um, if you want to see some of that code, see some more of the demos, some hands-on ways to build REST APIs, you can do that. We've got a coffee barista there. Um, you can do some other hands-on labs. Uh, program the, the Liberty Space Rover, and uh, we do have Voodoo Donuts. If you haven't had a Voodoo, if this is your first time in Austin, and you haven't had a Voodoo Donut, that's 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 one of the uh, cultural traditions or institutions you got to try out. And then we got all sorts of swag in there too. So um, be sure to find us if you have any questions about Call for Code. Um, hopefully we, you take part in the competition. But in any case, we've, we've got a Slack community. We've got the Be My App platform. Uh, so we'd love to see uh, folks take part in that. All right, well thank you very much. Have a great day.